I want to make some comments before we get into the message uh, this morning on a decision that the Supreme Court made just, just less than two weeks ago. The Roe versus Wade decision. Two Fridays ago, the Supreme Court made the decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. Amen. Yeah, that's okay. Let's put our hands together and thank God for that, that decision. Several weeks previous to the decision, I shared with you, our Elam Life Church family, my perspective and our perspective as a church, that we value life. I'm so thankful for the Supreme Court's perspective on this issue, and I'm thankful for the courage of the justices to, to send down this decision, to pass down this ruling. Because just like Psalm 127 says, children are a blessing from the Lord. Now, there are a few points that I want to make about this. Spent some time processing the, the decision that they made and our response as a church. And there's, there's some things that I'm, I'm processing that I want to process out loud with you guys. First thing is, this decision did not make abortion illegal in the United States. It passed down the decision to the states. So this is a great step. It's not yet the end of abortion in America. Second, along those same lines, we live in New York State. Our reality doesn't change with this ruling, except that we are now an abortion um, tourism destination. And our state is taking steps to make it more accessible all along the pregnancy and for everybody, whether or not they're a part of our state. Now, whether you're born here or you moved here, you are a New Yorker for a reason. One reason that we are here is to support the pregnancy care centers that are here. And we just finished last month our baby bottle drive, raising money for Caring Choices. Thank you so much for everyone who gave to that baby bottle drive. And just less than two weeks ago, our missions team gave just under $1,000 to buy a text notification system for Caring Choices to, uh, to help those moms and dads who are choosing life to be reminded of their appointments so that they can make it to their appointments at Caring Choices. We live in New York, so let's be a light here. Amen? One more thing for us to be aware of. Though this is a win for life, which we celebrate, many people in our state, in our nation, and in our world don't share that opinion. They don't see this the same way. For many, this is a devastating loss. And for many, now they're seeing the Supreme Court and anyone who's pro-life as anti-women, as anti-freedom, as anti-basic human rights. And though we disagree with that perspective, it's important for us to recognize that that's the way those who don't have our worldview look at us as, as their enemies, as enemies of women, as enemies of basic human rights. I believe this is a time for us to celebrate this great decision by the Supreme Court. But it's also a time for us to demonstrate our love and care for women and men everywhere who are in despair over this ruling and who consider us their enemy. Not the case. That is not our perspective. But it's time for us to increase our love and our care. It's time for us to rise up in prayer more than ever before for our divided nation to be healed. It's time for us to rise up in prayer for the culture of life to grow in New York State. Where we stand right now, that sounds impossible. It doesn't sound reasonable. But God is the God of the impossible. So let's be praying for the culture of life to grow in our state. It's time for us to increase our prayer and our support for our local pregnancy care centers, especially during this time when they're on the front lines of this thing. It's time for us to consider how the Lord is inviting us as the Big C Church and as Elam Life Church to come alongside families in difficult situations, to grow in our involvement in foster care and adoption, to support our hurting and our dying world in real practical ways. Ultimately, it's time for us to, to raise our game 
and lead people to Jesus. Because he's the one solution, the one real solution to this whole situation. Let's lead people to Jesus, church. So church, thank you for praying for this decision, praying for this moment for the last almost 50 years. Let's celebrate this great news and let's sensitively and intentionally love and care for those who have a different worldview than us in this moment, who are on the other side of this issue. Let's pray for their salvation, that they would come to know the God of life. Now is the time for us if you've been a part of our series recently, it's time for us to Romans 12, be the church. So let's be the church, church. And let's pray together right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the courage of our Supreme Court. We thank you for hearing our prayers over these 50 years and for responding in this way. Lord, we pray that you would heal our divided nation. My goodness, Lord, as we look at the news, as we hear the commentary, as we look at social media, it is amazing to see how many people disagree with this decision. Lord, I pray for your healing in our nation, in our governments, in our communities, in our churches, God, that you'd heal our divided nation. Lord, we pray for a culture of life to rise in New York State. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray that you'd bless our pregnancy care centers, everyone across the nation, Lord Jesus, who has, has more responsibility nor, more, uh, now, more opportunity now, Lord, to reach those who are in a really difficult time in their lives. Lord, I pray that you would bless your church as we come alongside these families that are in these very difficult situations, Lord God. That you would bless your church, that we would rise up, Lord, in, in the area of foster care, in the area of, of adoption, that we'd rise up in the area of evangelism, God, sharing you, sharing the God of life with a culture, with, a, with communities, Lord, with a nation that needs the God of life. Lord, we thank you for doing miracles. We thank you for, for saving babies and for saving moms and dads, families, Lord. Use us, your church, to be the church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Elam Life Church, for standing for life. Okay, now, I want to welcome you to the final week, week five of our Blessed Life series. I know about you, I've really enjoyed this series, seeing what God has done, seeing how God has been communicating to us about generosity, about, about living out our lives as generous sons and daughters of the King. Now, we've done a few really odd things this series. The first week, we did a reverse offering, where instead of receiving money from you, we gave money back to everybody. Now, I want you to listen to this testimony. We've, re we've read testimonies over the past several weeks of people who have participated in the reverse offering and the blessing that it's been to them to be able to give like God gives. Listen to this testimony. Hi, I'm the worship pastor at a church in Upper St. Clair, Pennsylvania, near Pittsburgh. I am licensed with Elam Fellowship, and my sister and her husband are involved at your church there. I just wanted to let you know, because I know these stories don't always get back to pastors, but recently you gave everyone an envelope with money inside to encourage them to bless someone with it. I was recently visiting my family and asked if I could borrow $50 and pay them back at my next paycheck. I was just a little late for gas money for the way home. My sister accepted and then felt the Lord telling her to give me 10 more dollars and she gave me 60. Not even an hour later, my sister found the envelope in her purse and realized she hadn't decided on anyone to give that to yet. And then she realized why God had placed the additional $10 on her heart. God wanted her to give the full 60 to me as a gift so that I did not have to pay her back. My heart is so full because I know this is not just my sister giving some extra money she had to her sister, but I know that God wanted me to have this and used your ministry and her openness to him to do it. So I just wanted to thank you as I am so blessed in and thankful to God for this help. Bless you and your ministry. Isn't that cool? To hear from some, we don't, usually get to hear from somebody who received the blessing of the generosity of the Lord in this way. But how amazing that God is using us to give his blessing to those in our communities. 
And I just want to thank you for participating in the reverse offering. If you haven't yet shared your story, that, that offering uh, testimony form is going to be up from here on out. So give us your stories. We'd love to hear them and celebrate with you. You can find those at elamlife.church slash reverse. All right, so that was week one. Now week two, we did something else unusual. We gave a tithe challenge. And the gist of that, I'm going to do this really quick. The gist of that is if you commit to giving 10% of your income to Elam Life Church in the form of a tithe for the next three months, we commit to giving, giving it back to you in full. If at the end of those three months, you can't say, God blessed me because of my obedience in this way. So if you commit to giving 10% over the next three months and God doesn't bless you, we will give you the full amount of your tithes and offerings back to you at the end of those three months. If that's something that you're like, all right, that will help get me over the hump of taking that risk in testing the Lord in this way. If that will help, grab one of our reverse, uh, I'm sorry, our, our tithe offering, nope, our tithe challenge, sorry, lots of, lots of terms going through my mind. Grab one of our tithe challenge cards on your way out. We would love to partner with you in that way and see the blessing of the Lord in your life. Now, this one last time, I want to encourage you to lean in as we hear this message, the blessed life message from Robert Morris of Gateway Church in Texas. We're going to listen to this one last message by video, and I'm going to wrap things up for us at the end. So lean in, check out the screens, and we'll talk in just a few minutes. And let me just let you know a little bit as I go before I get in this, the scripture, uh, I'm, a, I'm a math person. I've, I've, I've told you that before. Uh, I think in numbers— and uh, people ask me, like, uh, are you for this? Do you want to do this? Uh, do you want to expand Pastor Robert in this way? Or Debbie will ask me about uh, maybe remodeling something. So, okay. You, uh, she knows this by now. My team knows this by now. Um, until you say a number, I don't know if I'm for it or not. I can be for it philosophically, but I may not be for it because you might be thinking a completely different number than I'm thinking. And I've even shared with Debbie, I can't hear the words that are coming out of your mouth until I hear a number. It's like listening, some of you, this might aid you, but it's like listening to Charlie Brown's parents. Uh, I, what I hear is, what, 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 what? What, 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 $4,000. I heard that. I heard $4,000. That's what I heard. And, and, and that's okay. I can, I can decide how long will that take me to fulfill the what, what, what. But I, I have to have a number. Okay. In the same way, the title of this message is The Principles of Multiplication. Multiplication is a mathematical term, like addition or subtraction or division. But multiplication is better than addition when it comes to our resources. And our God is a God of multiplication. He is a God who can multiply. So let me ask you a question. Would it be all right with you if God multiplied your resources? Yes. Would that be all right? Okay, let me show you the two principles of multiplication from a very famous passage. Luke chapter 9, verse 12. It says, When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, Should the send the multitude away, that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place here. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, Well, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Now, let me stop just for a moment, because many, many people believe that Jesus fed 5,000 people. But that is not the case. Though in Jewish culture at that time, the way they counted crowds is they only counted the men, because they were counting families. So when it says there were 5,000 men... If you include the, the spouses and the children, and assuming that just each family had just two children, which per capita at that time it was four to five. But let's just say there were only two children. That'd be husband, wife, two children. That's four times 5,000. That's 20,000. 
that this is a much larger miracle. Now, let me just, just so you know, the Bible backs this up. Stay in Luke 9. But the parallel passage of this scripture in Matthew 14, verse 21 says, Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So you can refer to the feeding of the 5,000. That's fine. As long as you know in your mind it's 5,000 families, not 5,000 people. So this, with five loaves and two fish. I would say that our God is a God of multiplication. Okay? Let me go back to verse 14. There are about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. I just want to comment here that Jesus is also a math person. And they did so and made them all sit down. And then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and twelve baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. Now, again, because numbers jump out at me, I think, well, why, why were there twelve baskets? And there are some re uh, reasons theologically because of the region they were in. It was called the region of twelve and things like that. Uh, but one reason could have been that uh, Jesus wanted each disciple to have a doggy bag. I mean, it could have been, could have, I'm just saying, all right? Twelve baskets left over, all right? Now, here's what I like to do. I don't know if you've ever done this before, but I like to put myself in a Bible story. Have you ever done this? And, and imagine how would I have responded had I been there that day. So I want you to do that today. That's what we're going to do today, all right? I want you to imagine you're one of the 12, all right? And you're on the Messiah Search Committee. And you've got a great candidate. He's healing the sick and raising the dead uh, and walking on water, which is like a bonus messianic sign. It was not prophesied in the Old Testament. Jesus, like, threw it in as a bonus. And uh, so... You, you, you have a, a high attendance weekend, okay? And so everyone sends out a mass email, and you tweet about it, and you have the largest crowd you've ever had. Most theologians believe this is the largest crowd that, uh, with whom Jesus ever spoke. Most theologians believe that. Uh, so uh, all these people, 20, 25,000 people. I mean, it's phenomenal, all right? And so you have real good worship, and let's say it's a Sunday morning service, and then you turn it over to the guest Messiah to speak, and uh, he gets up, and at 12 noon, he should be, you know, wrapping up. That's, that's the way you know, the time of service should end if it begins at, you know, 1045 or 11, so it ought to be wrapping up about that time, but he keeps going. One o'clock, he's still going. Two o'clock, he's still going. I mean, if this is during football season, you've already missed the first game. <laughs> Three o'clock, four o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. Okay, listen, I am not exaggerating the text. Look, look, look at verse 12. It says, when the day began to wear away. You know what that means in the Greek? In the Greek, that means when the day began to wear away. <laughs> so this is just my holy imagination. I think the disciples formed a little committee. And I think they said, what are we going to do? <laughs> I mean, this is good, but this guy, he won't shut up. I mean, he's going all day. We've not had lunch break, snack break, anything. And I'll tell you what, if I don't eat soon, I'm going to die. <laughs> I'm right here. I'm going to die right here. I promise I will die if I don't get something to eat soon. And I think one of them probably said, you know what, that's it. And they said, what, what, what's it? Let's tell Jesus that the people are hungry. He seems to care a lot about the people. <laughs> he, he doesn't seem to care much about us, but he does seem to care a lot about the people. So now let's pretend that you get elected the spokesperson. All right? So I want you to see this in your mind. Jesus is up there. He's speaking. He's teaching thousands of people, and you approach him while he's speaking. That is the inference from Scripture is that he was still speaking when they went up to talk to him, all right? So, see it in your mind, all right? So you say, uh, Lord, hey, Lord, excuse me. Excuse me, Lord. Excuse me! Oh, uh, boy, this has been good today. I tell you, this is, this is really good. This series of messages that you're bringing all in one day. Um, but, um, 
we, we, we were talking and, and, and we feel like that, that the people are getting hungry. Uh, now, I could go all night. I was just saying to the guys, I said, John, I could go all night. I tell you, this is so good. Um, but um, uh, we feel like the, the people are getting hungry and, and it's getting late and, and the restaurants are just about to close, Lord. And um, so we feel like that it would be better if, if you would just um, wrap it up. And the Lord says, you're, you're, you're concerned about the people. Yes, Lord, it's, it's all about the people. And then, maybe you've never seen this, but I want you to pretend you're that disciple. Look, 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 look what he says to him in verse 13. So he said to them, well, then you give them something to eat. Excuse me? Yeah, you and your little group over there, you're concerned about the people. Why don't you give them something to eat? Okay. It, it didn't go like you planned, did it? But now you have to report back to the committee. See, that's the hard part, always reporting back to the committee. So you go back over and they say, well, did you tell them the people were hungry? Yes, I did. I, told, I, 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 I use those words exactly. I said the people are hungry. So is he going to dismiss the service? Well, what did he say? He said for us to give him something to eat. What? What did he say? He said for us to give them something to eat. What? Oh, look, this is a disaster. Just wait till the first church of the Pharisees hears about this. Oh, 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 oh. And then there's some little kid that snuck back into town, and he's walking by, and he's got a long John Silver sack. And so, you know, they just kind of grab the sack, and they open it up. He got the two-piece meal with extra rolls. And you can imagine Peter, you know, Peter probably just grabbed one of the rolls and just, and they said, stop it, Peter, stop it. That's all we have, that's all we have. And then one of them said, that's it. I said, what's it? Let's tell Jesus this is all we have. And he'll dismiss the service. Now, I want you to think, think with me just for a moment, think about this. If you had never read this story in the Bible, and you had 20,000 people and a two-piece meal, and you said, this is all we have, don't you think he would have dismissed the service? Does it, that, doesn't that make sense? It does it, yes or no? Does that make sense? Listen to me. Tithing doesn't make sense. Doing it God's way doesn't make sense. But it works. So, you're, again, you're the spokesman, and so, you know, you say, Lord, excuse me. Lord, just, just one more. This, uh, um, you know, you know, a moment ago we were talking, and I was telling you how good this series is, you know, Lord. And um, you said for, uh, you know, us to, um, you know, uh, get the people something to eat, and uh, we've been working on that. And, uh, but all we have, Lord, all we have, we have uh, uh, two fish, and we have um, almost five rolls, Lord. Peter ate some. And... Um, but, uh, but that, that's all we have, Lord. So we're thinking we should just go with our original idea and just, you know, just. And the Lord said, okay, let me get this straight. You have, you have two pieces of fish and almost five rolls. I, I know how Peter is. And that, that's what you have, right? Yes, Lord, that's, that's, that's all we have. Oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Have them sit down in groups of 50. Excuse me? Uh Lord, I, I don't think I was clear. Um, um, we, we don't have a lot of these snack packs, Lord. Um, there was a kid walking by. Peter took it from him, Lord. I didn't take it from him. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Have them sit down in groups 50. So now they're getting all these people to sit down in groups 50. Now, I'm going to give you just a little bit of my personal opinion here. I think while they were getting them to sit down, I think one of them might have remembered a scripture from the Old Testament and gathered the guys together and said something like this. Hey guys, I think I know what's going to happen. Do you remember in 2 Kings 4, Elisha fed 100 men with 20 loaves of bread. It, the bread multiplied and they even had some left over. That, that, that's in the Bible. 
And we have one greater than last year. By the way, the, that, those 20 loaves of bread, it, it specifically tells us they were first fruits. In other words, God can multiply the tithe. So he said, I, I, bet, I bet you when he prays over it, it's going to multiply right there in front of us. And that is actually what many Christians believe happened. That when Jesus prayed, it just multiplied. But that's not what happened. Now, here, here, here's what I, I can see happening. Peter probably just grabbed one. Cause I just kind of like Peter. He's kind of the forceful one. You know, he probably grabbed one and said, here, 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 Lord, pray over mine first. Here, pray over mine first. Here, Lord, pray over mine first. Watch, watch, watch what happens when he prays. Lord. Just watch, just watch. Pray over mine first. But look, look, look at what verse 16 says. He blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. Okay, so here's Peter saying, here, here, Lord, here, bless mine. And so Jesus takes this piece of bread from Peter, lifts it, lifts it up to heaven and says, Father, bless it. Breaks it and hands half of it back to Peter. Uh, are you through praying? <laughs> yes, Peter. It's blessed. Now go give it away. And you just watch what happens because the master's blessed it. You want to pray some more? <laughs> no, Peter. Now, I know the text doesn't say this, but the principle, think about the principle. Think about this. Jesus blessed it. Here's what he's thinking. Peter, you don't understand. Once you bring it to me first, and I bless it, you watch what happens. Because I blessed it. Personally, though, I think Peter walked up to the first person and said something like this. Take just a little piece. <laughs> what would you have said? Take a little piece, a little piece. He's going down the road, you know. Take a little piece, take a little piece. I said a little piece. You pig, what is wrong with you? You can't follow instructions or something. So you take, take a little piece. He gets down to the last guy. There's a crumb in his hands. Sweat from his brow down on his cheek. A little drop of sweat there. And right before the guy reaches to grab it, this crumb grows in Peter's hands. And Peter says, hey, you can have more. <laughs> Listen, the miracle did not happen in the master's hands. It happened in the disciples' hands. Once they gave the first to Jesus, and he blessed it. And then they gave over and above away. So, two principles of multiplication. All right, they're real simple. Here's number one. It has to be blessed before it can multiply. It has to be blessed before it can multiply. And we've learned from this series the way our finances are blessed. We, we've seen this over and over again. Is we bring the first 10% to the house of God. Even Hebrews backs it up, New Testament, that Jesus himself receives and blesses our finances. So you have to give the first. See, I know some people who give a little here and give a little there, but they don't bring the first 10% to the house of God. Listen to me, their finances are not blessed and they will never multiply because only Jesus can bless them. Think, think about this. What if the disciples had given away given out the two fish and the five loaves before Jesus blessed it. I'm going to say that again because that's extremely important. What if they had just started giving it away and Jesus had not blessed it? Would it ever have multiplied? No. It's a blessing. It's the same way when you give a little here and a little there, but you don't bring the first 10% to the house of God. It does not have the blessing of Jesus on it. There's a couple in our church that when I shared this series one time, uh, they had been giving 10%, but they'd been giving 5% to Gateway and 5% to uh, a missions organization. And when I shared about the tithe, all, the, we, we do believe in giving missions organizations, but that's over and above the tithe. The tithe comes to the local church where you are. And so they, they said, we had the check written, we tore it up, 
and made the check out for the full 10% to the church. And here's what they said. That was on a Sunday. On a Monday, we had been waiting, waiting for a bonus that we were supposed to receive and told we would receive it. we have been waiting for months for this bonus. And on Monday, it was in the mail, and they wrote a letter that said, we are so we feel so badly that this took so long for you to get this that we actually added some to it. And the amount that they added was the exact amount that they added the day before on their check. You will never convince me that was a coincidence. That's, it's God saying, do it my way. So it has to be blessed before it can multiply. Here's principle number two. It has to be given away before it can multiply. It has to be given away before it can multiply. So the first principle refers to, to tithing, bringing the first 10% to the local church, and Jesus blesses it. But once he's blessed it, now you can give over and above. You, you can give an, an extra offering, or, or to, for, for in our case, we call it heart for the kingdom. You can give offerings over and above to missions organizations, to things like this. Okay, But it has to be given away. Think about this. What if the disciples, after Jesus had blessed it, what if the disciples had eaten it? It never would have multiplied. Two, the two fish, five rolls. What if Jesus blessed it and then they just ate it? It never would have multiplied. There are a lot of people who will tithe, but they don't give anything above. It, and here's the, sad, here's the sad thing. It has the potential to multiply, but they just keep eating it. Okay, so let me tell you how this worked out in, in my own life and in Debbie's life. Uh, I got saved nine months after Debbie and I were married. And I heard, a few months later, I heard my first message on tithing, and immediately we tithe. And God began to bless us. Uh, I went to Bible college, and then I was a traveling evangelist. So I did not work at any church. I didn't receive any salary from a church at that time. I only received offerings or honorariums when I would travel and speak. And so while I'm doing that for a living, and... Um, the, the Lord spoke to me one day in my quiet time, and he said, I want you to get your finances in order so I can bless them. Now, I want you to think about that. That's a very important impression that I received from the Lord. I want you to get your finances in order so I can bless them. God cannot bless things out of order. And we have a stewardship department that can help you get your finances in order. So I said, well, Lord, what do you want me to do? Back then, I didn't know what to do. And he told me three things. So I'm going to tell you the three things he told me. He said, number one, get out of debt. Now, this means different things to different people. Different people have different convictions, okay? For us, we could still have a mortgage, uh, but we were not to borrow for depreciating items, only appreciating items, like a mortgage on a home. So we have a mortgage to this day, and we have had a mortgage but we put it on a 15-year note. We do our best to pay it off each, okay? So I just want you to know, because when I say that, I don't want you to, I want you to let the Lord apply it to you how he applies it to you, okay? So number one, he said, get out of debt. So for us, the first thing that we need to do, we had this car that was too big for us. The payment was too big. And so we sold that car and we bought a car for cash, $750. That was all we could afford so we bought a car for $750, but I, you got to hear me. We actually loved that car. I mean, we loved it because we were getting our finances in order. We loved that car. We prayed over it. Uh, we anointed it with oil about a quarter a week. And um, okay, second thing the Lord said to me was don't manipulate. Don't manipulate. Now, I was in ministry, but a whole, whole bunch of people manipulate for money. And God never blesses manipulation. Manipulation comes from a root word that means witchcraft. So you, you cannot manipulate. You can't drop hints and expect God to provide for you. And so for me, I said, well, Lord, how does that work out? He said, well, when someone asks you to come speak, they say, what are your financial requirements for coming? And you say, pay our expenses and give us an offering. And some of my friends would actually say, pay, us, or pay our expenses, give, me, give us an offering, and the offering has to be a minimum of, I never even said that. I just said, whatever, just pay our expenses and give us offer. Here's what the Lord said to me. He said, from now on, you say, I have no financial requirements for coming. By the way, this was about 30 years ago, and I still do that to this day. I have no financial requirements for coming. And the Lord said to me, I want to teach you who your provider is. That it's not how you arrange things, it's me. 
Now, again, other people, you can do things differently. Don't put this on, on you. Let the Lord speak to you what he wants you. So this guy calls me. I will never forget. First guy calls and says, uh, Robert, can you come and speak? I said, yes, we worked out day. He said, what are your financial requirements for coming? I said, I have no financial requirements for coming. And I remember he said, well, that's good because I don't even think we can pay your gas. Now, he didn't say pay your expenses. He said pay your gas. Let me tell you why that's important. We get in that $750 car. We start driving. It was to Oklahoma. We start driving to Oklahoma. I stopped to fill the car up with gas. I went in to pay for it, and the lady said to me, it's taken care of. I said, what do you mean it's taken care of? She said, because when you pulled in, God told me that I was to fill your car up with gas. And I went out, and I got in the car, and I said, Lord, I sure like doing it better your way than my way. And here's the third thing the Lord said to me, give. So he said, get out of debt, don't manipulate, give. Now, I have to tell you what happened. Uh, I, I said to the Lord, uh, I said, Lord, um, I do give, I tithe. Now, I, please don't get offended by this. This is just the, what I, the impression that I got in my spirit when I said that. I said, Lord, um, I do give, I tithe. I felt like the Lord went, <laughs> I mean, that really, I, I mean, I kind of felt like it was like, <laughs> idiot. You know, I and mean, that's what I felt. And I'm like, what do, you, what do you mean? Lord, I do. I give 10%. He said, you don't give 10%. You return 10%. He said, the 10% is mine. And when you read the language in the Bible, if you don't return it, then you've stolen it. That's the language. I can show it to you in uh, uh, Joshua and in Malachi. Robbed and stolen. Those are the two words God uses. He used it. So I said, well, Lord, what do you mean give? He said, I mean give over and above the tithe. That's when you give. And I asked him three very important questions. I said, well, Lord, how will I know when to give? How will I know where to give? And how will I know how much to give? Aren't those important questions? Listen to his very simple answer. Here's what he said. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. My people hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. And so I said, okay, Lord. So at, not long after that, I go to speak to the church. Now, you have to remember, the only salary that Debbie and I received was when I would go speak in the church and if they would give us an offering. And I said, you don't have to give us anything. So I go to speak for this church, and it's the only speaking engagement I have for the whole month. I only have one engagement that whole month, all right? And it's at a church with about 60 people in attendance. And I go and I speak at that church, and I said, I have no requirements coming. The pastor gets up afterwards. He tells the whole church that. He said, yes, he has no financial requirements coming. I want us to give an offering. I want us to give a, a, a good offering. So they count it, and then they bring a check to the pastor. And we're standing like right here at the front. And the pastor brings me this check. He says, look at this. Look at this. He said, we've never given this much. And he was so excited to be able to do that. And I looked down at the amount, and the amount was, a, was the exact amount of our monthly budget. Exactly. And while I'm looking at that check and thinking how faithful God is, I kind of glance up and I look over the shoulder of this pastor that's talking to me, and I see at the back of the church a missionary that had just spoken right before I spoke, shared a report, and this voice said to me, give him the offering. And I remember exactly what I thought. I rebuke you, Satan. <laughs> that's, that's not God. That's not God. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. That is not God. I remember, this is funny, I know, but I remember even saying, that's not you. That's not you. I know you. that's not you. You would not do that, God. And then I remember the Lord said to me, I told you that I would tell you when to give and where to give and how much to give. And I'm telling you to give right now to that missionary the whole amount. And so the sanctuary was clearing out by now, and I endorsed the check when no one was looking, folded it in half, and I went to the missionary and said, I'm going to give you something, but don't look at it until after you leave, because it was a very large amount, and I said, and um, don't ever tell anyone I did this, because I didn't want to manipulate in any way. I, I have, I believe now, I'm supposed to share these testimonies to help other people, but back then I didn't share any of these things that I was doing. So I gave him this offering, and uh, he, he, you know, said thank you, and then Debbie and I walked outside, and there were some couples standing in the parking lot. And one of the couples said, hey, we're going to go get some pizza. Do y'all want to go? And we said, yeah, you know, because we were broke, you know. And so, yeah, sure, oh, yeah, sure, we love going to eat pizza. So we go eat pizza with them, and there are 
six couples total. So Debbie and I and five other couples. The six guys sat on, if you see this in your mind, sat on one end of the table. The six girls sat on the other end of the table. Debbie's all the way at the end, on that end. I'm at this end, all right? And then this guy across from me that I had met one time before, just once, I just met him one time, he just leans across the table like this, you know, and so, and he said to me, how much was the love offering? Just like that. And again, because I'm a numbers person, I knew exactly what it was, and so I told him the number. And remember, it was an offering, not an honorarium. An honorarium is with zeros. It's a round amount, like 250 or $500 or something like that. This was an offering that had, you know, dollars and cents on it. So I told him how much it was. And then this guy says to me, where's the check? Like that. And, and I know you're supposed to tell the truth. But I got kind of flustered. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know why this guy was questioning me. And so I just heard myself say, Debbie has it. <laughs> and so he says to me, go get it. I want to see it. So I said, okay. So I get up, and I walk down where Debbie is, and I lean down to her, and I said, how's your pizza? Is it good? Okay, good. You know, there's nothing else to say. There's no check. And so I go back, and again, I know you're supposed to tell the truth, but I don't know, why is this guy asking me this? Why is he questioning me? And I didn't want to say, in my heart, I didn't want to brag. I didn't want to say, we gave it to a missionary, and it's the only meeting we have this month. And I didn't want to say that. And so I just heard myself again. I said, it's in the car. <laughs> and he said, it's not in the car. So I said, where is it? <laughs> I mean, you know so much, pal. I just, I started getting frustrated. Why is this guy grilling me like this? What is, what's going on here? And this guy said to me, who, oh, by the way, is now a member of our church and has verified this, this testimony. This guy said to me, you gave it away, didn't you? I said, yes. I said, how, how do you know that? I'd only met him one time before. I said, how do you know that? He said, because God told me. And he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a check that he had written before he came to the service that night. And I found out later, which I didn't even know, he didn't even attend that church. He just heard I was speaking and God told him, go give him this check. So he writes a check out before he comes. He holds this check out that's made out to our ministry and he holds it up like this. Now listen to me, before God in heaven, and this man has verified this, it was exactly 10 times the amount of the check that I just get right down to the penny. Exactly. He said, here. And he's holding the top of it. I reached out and I took the bottom of it, but he wouldn't let it go. <laughs> and I, I, I realized he, he wants to tell me something. He wants to say something. I now know he wanted to impart something. You do know there's a gift of giving in the body of Christ. There's a gift of giving. That's a spiritual gift. So I'm holding the bottom. He's holding the top. He looked right across the top of the check, right into my eyes, and he said, God's about to teach you about giving so you can teach the body of Christ. And he let the check go. Here's what came into my mind when he let that check go. I, here's what I thought. This is God's money. This is not my money. This is God's money. All of it from now on is God's money. By God's grace, I have had that thought with every check that I've received since then. And we've been very blessed financially because for some reason people buy the books that I write and so we've been very, very blessed. I still don't know why, but we've been very blessed. We've been able to give a whole lot to the kingdom of God. But I thought this is God's money. Do you know the first thing we did? We bought a single mother car and we still had the $750 car. We started paying people salaries that were out of work. We started giving 70% of our income to the Lord. We just started giving, and we never told anyone, and, and th money started coming in from everywhere, and we just kept funneling it through to people. I remember a few years later, we uh, uh, had a van that we traveled in as a green van, and uh, I remember the Lord told me to actually to sell it, and we traveled all the time at that time. My son, who's, who's 
uh, my oldest son, Josh, some of you know him, um, when he was three years old, we were somewhere speaking, and someone actually said to him, where do you live? He said, in the van. So, um, so the Lord told me to sell the van for $12,000. I sold it. We went to the mission field right after that, and this missionary uh, what drove this old rickety van, and I said, why don't you get you a new van? He said, I'm about to. He said, God showed me last week a van that we're going to buy. I said, how much is it? Anyone want to take a guess? $12,000. And we bought that man. I, we've been living this way for years. Giving and giving and giving extravagantly. And, and it, it's verified. The elders of the church know it. Steve knows it. Steve is telling me I'm one of the highest givers in the church. And it's not because of my salary. It's because of the outside income that the Lord's blessed me with. And I'm grateful for that. But let me wrap this up. Let me tell you what happened. A few years after this, I was having my quiet time. And the Lord just spoke to me one day. I was reading in Philippians about Jesus gave up everything. And the Lord said to me, would you give me everything? And when he said it, I knew what he meant. And he meant everything in my personal checking account, everything in our, Debbie and mine, everything in our personal savings, everything in our ministry account, and everything in our ministry savings, which would be like a business account, that was where, where we, our income came from. Everything in our retirement. At that time, we had two cars, both cars, and our house. And the way we, we did that, by the way, because we gave it to a pastor that had five children, and the church said the best way for you to do it would be to, for the church to buy the house as a parsonage, and then you give the proceeds back to the church. And so that was what we did. And there's the man who did that, who oversaw that transaction, is also a member of our church now, and can verify that we gave that to the church. So, and that was not Gateway, that was the church I was a member of a long time ago. So, anyway, we gave everything away. So the next morning, I'm thinking about it, and I'm because I'm a math person, I'm adding it up in my mind. All these accounts, you know, the, the cars, the house, I'm adding it up, and the Lord said to me, what are you doing? I said, nothing. He said, no, what, what are you doing? I said, well, I don't want to tell you what I'm doing. And you know, if you're thinking something, but you don't tell him what you're thinking, he doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, he knows, just so you know, he knows. So I said, well, Lord, I said, I, I, I'm not having a real spiritual thought right now, so I don't want to tell you. He said, tell me what you're thinking. I said, well, you know that old saying, you can't outgive God? He said, yeah, I've heard that. I said, um, well... I said, I don't mean this wrong, but I think I did. <laughs> I mean, when you add up everything that I gave, I said, this time I think I've got you. I have no reason why I said that word. I said, I, I think I've got you like that. And the Lord said to me, you think you've got me? And when he said that, the phone rang. And I picked up the phone. By the way, the man on the other end of the phone is a member of our church now and has verified this story also. I picked up the phone and I said, hello? And this guy said, Robert, God told me to help you with your transportation. And I thought, he's going to buy us a car. But even if he buys us a car, um, we just gave away both cars. By the way, at that time, we'd given away nine cars. We've given away a lot more cars since then. And by the way, let me just uh, brag on the Lord through you. Last year, you, Gateway Church, gave over 100 cars to people. So it, it's contagious, the spirit of giving. And so, anyway, I, I was like, well, you need to get a car, Lord. I still got you. Because gave away all the retirement and house. And I said, I still got you. But thank you for the car, you know. And uh, so I said, well, what did the Lord tell you to do? That's what the guy said. He told me to buy you an airplane. And he said, I'm going to pay for the maintenance and the hangar and the insurance and the fuel and I've hired a pilot and I'm going to pay his salary here's his name and number and you just call him and tell him where you want to go and when you want to go and the Lord said to me gotcha <laughs> gotcha now, now now listen to me this is not a message give and you get an airplane okay <laughs> by the way to, I want to clarify he gave the use of the airplane to us and we gave the use of it back to him about a year later and I, we don't have an airplane today. I don't own an airplane. The church doesn't own an airplane. So it's, this is not about an airplane because that is not the best part of the testimony. Here's the best part of the testimony. 
A while after that, I was reading, and I was reading the most famous story about Solomon, and you know this story. What's the most famous story about Solomon? The most famous story about Solomon is that God said to Solomon, ask anything you want, and I'll give it to you. Can you imagine God saying that to you? Can you imagine that? So I'm reading that, and I thought it said at night the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream and said, ask anything you want. So I thought the Lord leads us when we're reading the Bible. I thought, I wonder what happened that day. What happened that day was he was inaugurated the king of Israel, and it was tradition for the king to sacrifice one bull when he was inaugurated. Do you know how many Solomon sacrificed? 1,000 bulls. 1,000. That's pretty extravagant. And I remember the Lord said to me that day, I only say to extravagant givers, ask anything you want. He said, I would never say that to a selfish person because I couldn't trust them. But I can trust givers. Now, I'm not even thinking about that Debbie and I had given away everything we had. But right then, when the Lord said that to me, he said to me, Ask. Ask anything you want. And I knew exactly what I wanted. I've been very honest with you, and you know this. I have an immoral past. I was immoral after Debbie and I were married. And I thought when she finds out, it's going to end our marriage. So I knew exactly what I wanted. I said, God, I want for Debbie and I to be passionately in love for the rest of our lives. And this May, we celebrate 35 years of marriage. That's better than an airplane. That's better than an airplane. anyone else encouraged by the word of God and then hearing testimonies and stories that back up what the word says that reinforce for us in real everyday modern life that God is true to his word that God is faithful to what he says I think I I might have shared this with you before but in, in preparation for this this series uh, and then in walking through this series, that's the fourth time I've seen that, that message. And uh, it still, still hits. It still hits home. Seeing how God is true to who he is and how God is true to his word. And now hopefully, as we bring this thing to a close, hopefully you have a little bit more of an idea of why we did the series this way of why I wanted us to hear this message, these messages from someone who has lived this this life. Man, I want to receive, I want to receive a new new anointing from God for giving and for generosity. And I want us to receive that impartation as well as a church. A couple things that he shared today. It has to be blessed before it can multiply and has to be given away before it can multiply. I love this idea that the miracle didn't happen in the master's hands. It happened in the disciples' hands. I love the idea that this is God's money. This is God's money. Everything that we we receive from that reverse offering Underwear drawers at home, it's God's money. We can trust him with everything. We can trust him with everything because this is who God is. And this is how he functions. And if we can trust him with our very lives and eternities, if we can trust him that at the very end, after we've taken our last breath, 
that our eternities are secure in his arms, then we can trust him with our everything today, including our finances. I know that this is a challenging series. This is a challenging message to hear. I also know that we're going to be hearing more and more testimonies like what he shared as we live this out, as we take, take on this challenge, as we take on the challenge that God gave us to test him and see how he'll respond. As we bring this thing to a close, I want to invite you to stand as I pray, as I bless us as a church. Let's stand to our feet and say, Lord Jesus, we give you our everything again. Jesus, I confess that as a human being, I tend to hang on to things that I think are my own. I grab on and I hold on tight because I feel like I need to be the one to preserve what is mine. Lord, would you forgive me for that attitude? Would you forgive me for that perspective? Would you enable me, Lord Jesus, to live like everything is not mine, to live like everything is yours, Lord. To live not with a closed fist, but with an open hand. Lord, I believe your word when you say that I can trust you with my eternity. Would you help me to believe your word when you say I can trust you with my everything? Because Jesus, that's how I want to live. And Lord, that's how I want our church to live. Holy Spirit, I pray your blessing and I speak your blessing over these, my, my sisters and my brothers, your sons and your daughters. Lord, I bless your church with a new understanding of the generosity of their king, their father, with a new understanding of the, the economy of God. Lord, that we give our first fruits. We don't give our last fruits after we've seen that you've provided enough for everything else. Lord, we give you our first fruits. And we say, Lord, would you receive this as worship? I'm trusting you. You're going to be faithful to your word and you're going to be faithful to provide. Lord, would you bless your people, your sons and your daughters, with a new anointing of generosity, of giving, of living like you, in their families, in their communities, in their world. Lord, we say yes to you again. We receive your blessing. We receive the blessing of a blessed life that you want us to live. And we recognize that it starts with us living according to your word. So we say yes again today. We say yes again today. And we thank you, God. We thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness your generosity. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Thank you for being a part of this series. Thank you for being a part of this church. I love you, and I'm excited to keep running forward with Jesus together with you. Don't forget to come back next week for our, the beginning of our At The Movie series. And I want to say a special thing right now. If you need prayer for anything, I want to invite any members of our ministry teams who are here to come and, and pray. And if you would like to pray for a couple special people, James and Lydia Harrington are going to be going this coming Saturday, Saturday to Uganda for their first team trip since COVID. It's the first time that James in a long time has led a trip like this, a team trip. And so as we support Ugandan Water Project, as a church, I want to invite you, if you want to come up and pray over Lydia and over James, they're going to be coming right up here to the middle in just a moment. Come on up, lay your hands on them, and pray with me as we pray them out from here. But I pray, bless you as you go. Thank you for being a part of this thing, and we'll see you soon. God bless.